Well, good morning. What a great thing to see all of our friends from downstairs of preschool, Slancha, which means health in Irish. Um, good morning. I'm so glad that you're here. If you can, uh, we'd love to know who you are. If you could take your connection card that's in your bulletin and fill that out. There's a there's some spot there's a spot on the back that has uh, small groups. If you were to sign up for those now, unfortunately we're wrapping those up, so it wouldn't do you much good at this point. But those are really good small groups, and more are coming. Uh, but there are some next steps based on the, the message that I'm giving today. Uh, but w w we would just like to connect with you and to um, know that you're here so we can say thank you. Um, my, my good friend Pam has a birthday today. So she, happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> yeah, my, who's? Lila? Lila's birthday too. Where, there she is. So we have a couple St. Patrick's Day babies. Um, on a few announcements. On Tuesday, the WSCSS uh, is going to have a meeting. They're going to meet at noon for their lunch, bring a sack lunch, and uh, just enjoy get, chatting with each other. But then there's going to be a, a special dessert served. And at 1 o'clock, there will be a, pro, a program on peace. And to prepare for that, before you come, look up some Bible verses about peace that and be prepared to discuss what you feel about those verses saying to us about peace. Um, on Thursday, there's a book group, and it'll be meeting down the hall here to the right in the lounge. It's a discussion led by Cheryl Cross on the book, The Violin Conspiracy. Then next Sunday is Palm Sunday, already. Palm Sunday. And then the following Sunday is Easter. And the choir is planning some uh, special music for both those Sundays. And as a reminder uh, to the choir members, there is practice today after the worship service. Um, remember to order your lilies if you want to order those. Uh, you can do that uh, by calling into the church office and letting us know that you want to purchase those so we can decorate the front here for Easter. Um, so now the, the week between Palm Sunday and Easter is called Holy Week. And oftentimes there are services, special services during Holy Week on Monday, Thursday, and on Friday. However, this year there's no services here in this building, but at our sister church in Waterford, Waterford Trinity United Methodist, where I'm also the pastor, we will be doing a Good Friday service, and it will be a Taze service. It's a special service of song and silence and contemplation. So I encourage you to come. Uh, I'm making it my habit to celebrate something every week. And this week I want to celebrate our volunteer liturgists. Uh, Tony Bull is going to be our liturgist today. But we've had new liturgists uh, willing to step up. We've had veterans doing it. And I'm just so thankful for, for all the work that they do putting together uh, the, the prayers and, the, and the, the effort that goes into it. And you'll, you'll see. Tony's pretty good at writing prayers. So uh, <laughs> I'll turn it over to Tony for the, for the call to worship. It's in your bulletin. Oh, yeah, oh, one, one minute. Uh, Shelly's going to talk about a very fun event that's coming up, our murder mystery. So there's still time to sign up. So um, you don't have to be a member of this church to be able to participate. So I've got the form here. It's going to be April 27th. It's a Saturday from 6 to 9 p.m. So I ask you, please sign up by the 21st so we can plan, because it's a dinner also. Um, it's $15 a person. On here is the rolls. You do not have to take a roll. Just sign up above it for um, spectators. So in the past, we've had anywhere from 40 to 80 people show up. So this year, it is the Roaring Twenties. It's Murder by Bathtub Gin. So there's a lot of really interesting names for the characters but i just ask you if you want to take a part please sign up i know our older kids i've got some asterisks by parts that they could take so if you'd like to sign up please sign up it'll be in cyril's hall thank you shelly and good morning everyone and happy saint patrick's day to us all it's great to see the church so full and vibrant this morning let us now center ourselves and let's stand for our call to worship, please. 
Our call to worship this morning is a responsive reading, which is printed in our church bulletin and is also projected on the screen. Please, please join me. As we gather on this St. Patrick's Day, let us reflect on the deep formation of our mission, shaping who we are becoming. Recognizing that we cannot give what we have not received, let us open our hearts to God's abundant grace as the emerald landscapes unfold before us. In every moment, God is moving toward the world, and we are invited to join in his divine involvement just as the spirit dances with joy in the rain. Let us uh, remain standing now for our opening hymn. It's an old traditional Irish hymn, the Old Rugged Cross, hymn number 504 in our worship hymnals. <laughs>
please be seated. Let's now have the children's message. Yes. Oh, wow. You guys are amazing. How about you guys have a seat up here with me? And 
Let's have a seat. Oh, there's a song that goes with it. Hmm. And I'm going to invite all of the kids to come up who are sitting out there. None of you adults try and get up. You're not kids. Oh my goodness, so I think this is like a record number of kids in the chancel. What do you guys think? It's a lot of kids. So I'm Dr. Althea Simpson. I am the Director of Discipleship here at Franklin Church. And I'm standing behind you guys because I needed the microphone, but I'm going to hand it up to Josie so I can come out. Hey, you're cool as a cucumber. Look at you. You're like, that's okay. <laughs> that one, that's, that's for the piano. So, happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> I'm going to try that again. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Okay, and everybody has in their hand the symbol of Ireland, which is called, anybody know what this is called? It is a clover leaf, which is also known as part of the shamrock family. And how many of you know who St. Patrick was? Okay, Josie, so who was St. Patrick? Um, well, he was this, um, I sh we learned about him on Tuesday, but I kind of, I forgot. Okay, so I'll tell you. So St. Patrick is the patron saint of the country of Ireland, and he taught people about God by using a shamrock. So the story goes. So, he taught them about the Father, the Son, the Spirit, using this shamrock. And so, we celebrate St. Patrick's love for people and sharing God with people, a lot of times by having parades or wearing green. So, the first parade in the world was actually in a place called St. Augustine, Florida. How many of you have ever been to Florida? Raise your hand. Okay. And it was in the year 1601. And then the next parade is in a place called New York City. How many of you have ever been to New York City? Do you know that they did not start having parades in Ireland until the 1800s? So. We are much faster at having parades. So, how many of you guys have ever been to a St. Patrick's Day parade? Not me, not you? Okay, so if you've ever been to a St. Patrick's Day parade, I want you to stand up. Okay, I've been to one, so I'm gonna keep standing up. I've been to more than one. So. It's nice to have some experience. How many of you have ever been to a St. Patrick's Day parade? Oh, I saw some loud and proud hands back there. So, what we're going to do today is I want my little leaders who have been to a St. Patrick's Day parade to come down here. Come on, little leaders who have been. Hi, guys. 
Can you guys come down here for me? We're going to we're going to let you be in front since you've had a parade before. Come on. So today we're going to have a St. Patrick's Day parade. So get your clovers in your hand, hold them up high. And our leaders out front are going to start and they're going to follow behind me for our St. Patrick's Day parade. And all the rest of you are going to follow us, okay? Okay. So while everybody's coming back, I want to remind you that Sunday after next, March 31st, is the biggest celebration in the church, Easter Sunday. And right after service Sunday morning, we're going to have our version of an egg hunt. So we won't have a bunch of screaming, running, jumping on each other, trying to find eggs in the, in the grass. They'll be out there till July but we will do a scavenger hunt and be able to trade it in for a bag full of surprises. So we want you guys to come out and join us. Everybody's invited. Service again is at 9.30, and then right after is the egg hunt. Yep. I already said that. <laughs> uh, it's. It's Lila's birthday and Pam's birthday. And Judy, who's probably watching in Florida. Hi, Judy, happy birthday. So thank you guys for joining us. We're gonna end in a word of prayer. Can you guys put your hands together and bow your heads and we will pray. Dear God, thank you for your love. Help us, Help us to share it, share it with others. With others. Amen. Amen. Okay. And now let us pass the peace. No. You could just stand and greet each other where you are.
please pray with me. Our Father, our lives are busier and more stressful than ever. As we move throughout our daily routine from one appointment to the next, we find ourselves not in charge of our own time. We preoccupy ourselves with the many necessary tasks that keep our daily lives on track, but seldom do we take time out to grow our relationship with you. That quiet, personal time that we can keep just to ourselves, shutting out the demands of work and obligations seems forever out of reach. We find ourselves struggling for that sense of balance between the workplace, our families, our community, and the countless other responsibilities that keep us from feeling truly at peace. When this personal time escapes us, we grow weary and our patience grows thin. Father, forgive us for not raising these concerns up to you in prayer. Oftentimes we look for a quick fix or a path of least resistance when in fact we should be asking for your guidance your direction, and your presence through prayer. Though we seldom seem to get a direct answer, Father, we can be more at peace with our chosen path through our faith and through raising these concerns up to you. Help us, Father, to take time out to celebrate and give praise for the many blessings we have around us. We give thanks for the abundant comforts we have throughout this land, our freedoms, our natural resources, and our heritage. We celebrate and give thanks for these many blessings, but too often fail to acknowledge that these gifts emanate from you and your love for us. Help us to turn from selfish acts of self-indulgence as your son Jesus Christ so perfectly did throughout his 40 days in the wilderness. Help us to resist the temptations that keep us from becoming loyal children of God, the sons and daughters of Abraham. Teach us to break down walls so we may become more like Christ in our compassion for others, to spread peace throughout the globe so we may all share in the glorious world together. We know, Father, that miracles such as these are possible through earnest prayer. As we move through the late months of winter and onto the onset of spring, we ask that you help us to shore up our faith and our Christian convictions so we may better prepare to help those who may not be as fortunate. Father, we ask that you place your hand of healing grace on those church family members mentioned on our Franklin Community Church prayer list. Keep them within the borders of your righteous and healing path. Hear us now, Lord, as each of us reflects upon our innermost thoughts and concerns and peacefully raises them up to you. Remain with us now, O Lord, as we recite that familiar prayer your beloved Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Maria. That was lovely. Uh, please stand and let's recite collectively uh, our prayer of illumination. Holy God, reveal your presence to us this day as we journey this path with your Son. Through all of life's trials and tribulations, your word sustains us for the journey ahead. Send your spirit upon us that we might listen, discern, and take heart. Be near us this day, and may your word with us well with us forevermore. Now let's be seated this morning for the scripture lesson. I feel we can listen more closely when seated. I'm going to depart from the bulletin just a tad, if I may, Pastor John. Okay. <laughs> okay. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the uh, book of John, chapter 5, verses 1 through 17. After this, there was a festival of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool, called in Hebrew, Beth Zatha, which has five porticos. In these lay many ill, blind, lame, and paralyzed people. One man was there, who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The ill man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. Jesus said to him, Stand up, take your mat, and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. Now that day was a Sabbath, so the Jews said to the man who had been cured, It is the Sabbath, it is not lawful for you to carry your mat. But he answered them, the man who made me well said to me, Take it up and walk. Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had disappeared in the crowd that was there. Later Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Do not sin any more, so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore the Jews started persecuting Jesus, because he was doing such things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My Father is still working, and I also am working. May God add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of the Scripture. Praise be to God. So this is our fifth in our series about living a deeply formed life we can draw from the experience of St. Patrick. St. Patrick, as Dr. Simpson said, was the patron saint of Ireland. But we know that Patrick was not Irish, right? He was, he was British. He was born a, over in Britain as a Roman citizen. And he was captured by Irish pirates when he was 16, and he was forced to work as a sheep herder for six years until he escaped and made his way back home. And he later became a priest. And he felt God was calling him back to Ireland. So he went back and he, he did his work. He was committed to, what, what they, to, to his mission to, to share the good news about Jesus Christ there. He faced numerous challenges, but he persisted. He faced opposition from Druids and the chieftains, but still he persisted. And still today, St. Patrick serves as a reminder of the importance of our adaptability and cultural sensitivity in Christian missions. We ought not go into a place and cause harm. We should go into a local culture and inspire and come alongside diverse communities in meaningful ways. St. Patrick's unwavering commitment to his mission, despite adversity, encourages Christians to persevere in spreading the gospel message, even in challenging environments. So today I want to dive into the idea of making a positive impact in the world in, in line with what we believe is God's mission for us. 
Now, I, wanna, I, I didn't warn her ahead of time, but we have a chair of missions. And she's sitting right back there. If you could just raise your hand. That's Marta. Now, she provides us many, many opportunities to be in service in the world. Uh, a big one that's coming up is the uh, Day of Love, or Community Love Day, where we spread out across our area and we make, make an impact, we make a difference in the world. So be on the lookout for that. But, what's that? May 18th, thank you, yes, yes. And we believe that's part of our God's mission for us here, but it's more than that. It's just, it's more than what the church organizes. It's, it's what we do individually also. Because think about it, there are countless needs out there. And as we try to lend a hand, it's crucial to find ways that only meet those needs, but also without causing harm to anyone involved, including ourselves. And that can feel like an uphill battle. I mean, just look around us. There's brokenness and fear all around us. And people can get really heated. Plus, let's face it, we're, we're, as a people, we're kind of all over the place, right? We're, um, sometimes we're inconsistent. Sometimes we're doubting ourselves. We're doubting other people. You name it. But here's the thing. Even with all that's going on, even with all the challenges that are culture and our society faces today, God is still nudging us into action. God is still expecting us to take action. Despite the, the, the messiness and the doubts, he's saying, let's, let's do this. Let's, let's do mission together. It's amazing when you think about it. God is in the business of rallying folks like us. With, with our flaws and everything, to make a difference? Can we actively address injustice, poverty, and pain without being overwhelmed by our own good, good intentions? And the answer is a definite yes, but there are ways to do it. But there's a crucial insight that we need to, need to grasp first before we can contemplate taking action, before we can commit to doing some thing, some project or some work of God's, his actions, we have to understand that his actions precede ours. God's word precedes ours. His presence precedes ours. We can't be so arrogant as to say that we are introducing God into the equation. Rather, we're aligning ourselves with God's ongoing work and God's ongoing purpose. It's a profound realization that we're participating in a mission that God initiated long before we arrived on the scene. St. Patrick didn't bring Christianity to Ireland. There are Christians already there. He was made a Christian by, by someone in Ireland already. Think about it. God is always around. God always is around because he loves the whole world. We have that scripture, right? We know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So when we think about being a part of what God is up to in the world, it's not about starting with all of our problems and all of our differences and all of our wants and needs. It's about knowing that God loves every single bit of the world and every single person in it, no matter what. Let's consider what that truly means by being deeply formed in mission. It involves showing up authentically and allowing the work to, that we engage in to shape us according to God's will. And not us barging in and reshaping the world into our image. Remember, the people that we're called to serve are not projects that we are called to fix. Instead, they are individuals with whom we are called to build relationships. These connections are divinely guided. And through them, we fulfill God's purpose of love and compassion. So we need to shift our focus away from guilt and fear and instead open our hearts to boundless love and grace and mercy because Jesus sees you. Jesus sees all of us. He sees our struggles. He sees our imperfections. He knows our setbacks. 
and yet still extends a warm invitation to join with him in God's mission. And it's not just about fulfilling tasks. Every other month we fill, we fill uh, bags, uh, make meal kits for the people in need in Detroit and Pontiac. Yes, it, 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 it's a task that needs to be done. People count on that food. But it's not just about the task. Because if it were just about filling the task, we could probably pay some kid minimum wage and get a whole bunch of them done and just be done with it for the year. It's about being connected to life and love. It's about being connected to God's own life and love because we do it out of the love that God has given us. Our connection to God through Jesus is paramount. And when we, if we neglect our mission and just focus only on the love, then the world is deprived of the blessings that God intended to flow through us. So we need both. We both need to experience God's love and we need to do something in response to it. It's, it's a dance, but both are needed. So let's embrace this calling with joy and with dedication, knowing that through us, God's love and grace can touch countless lives. It's all about starting with our genuine selves. It's all about being exactly who we are. And then from that place, our acts of service can just flow naturally, shaping us into the kind of people that God always meant for us to be. It's like when we're our true selves, our actions become more meaningful and aligned with God's plan for us. So in today's scripture, we see from Jesus examples of what it means to be in mission. Did you picture the scene when he was reading it? There's uh, this huge crowd at the sheep gate. Five porticos. Loads of folks, all sick and injured and struggling in some way. And Jesus goes there. He goes where the need is. He goes where there's pain and heartache. And there, he goes where there is the greatest need. And he's present with them. He offers them his presence. He's opening his, his heart to them. And then Jesus comes across this guy who's been struggling for, what is it, 38 years? And G Jesus, being Jesus, doesn't, of course, just brush past him. Because, let's face it, it's hard. It's difficult being around people who are struggling. It makes us uncomfortable. It's hard being around people who, who really desperately need something, and, and so we feel awkward sometimes. But not Jesus. Jesus doesn't brush past them. No, he stops and says, do you want to be better? Do you want to be made well? He, he wants to make sure that what he has to offer that the man actually wants. And it turns out this poor guy's been facing some serious barriers that he believed that if he got, just got down to the, the, the water that he would be able to get some healing. But every time he tried to go down, the, the, he wasn't able to because someone would get into the water first. And so he was unable to even do the thing that he thought needed to be done. Jesus saw that as an injustice. Because it is an injustice. We should take turns, right? He should have had his chance, but he never did. So Jesus healed him right then and there. And this guy was so happy. He took up his mat and he went. And he, he didn't know Jesus' name. He didn't know who he was. But he just got up and he, and he walked. And people were asking him, how did this happen? And then later on, he, he ran into Jesus. And, and then he started telling everybody about what Jesus did for him what Jesus is doing through him is now explaining what he can do. What my faith has done in my life and what Jesus has done with me is how we share the good news. And that's an important distinction, what Jesus has done with me instead of what has Jesus done for me. Jesus takes our life and makes it into something better. Jesus takes our life and moves it in a direction. So when we talk about the good news, we talk about Jesus, what Jesus is doing with me, not for me. Because we're supposed to be believing and doing. Instead, Jesus fo focused on the, the, the tangible impact he was making right then and there. He spoke about 
in his first sermon about freeing captives. He wasn't talking about heaven. He wasn't talking about escaping this earth after death. He was talking about, in his first sermon, about uh, lifting the burden of oppression and the task that he was sent to do by his father. And you know what's fascinating? That we're not just passive observers in this grand narrative of God. We're invited into the story. Just as Jesus was sent into the world, so are we sent into the world. Our very existence and our actions are intertwined with this journey of following Jesus. It's about embodying his teachings and participating in the mission that Jesus has set before us. So, as I have done in the last several weeks, I've given you four things that you can take and possibly do. Do them all. Do one, do two, your choice. But these are practices you can put in, in place in your life for, for a deeper formed life. Okay, the four practices. The first one is hospitality. Now, my sister-in-law, Holly, has the gift of hospitality. You come into her, her house, she welcomes you, she makes you feel like right at home, and she makes sure all of your needs are met. She's just the most welcoming, wonderful person probably I know. So it's all about welcoming others with open arms. It's about making them feel at home. But it's not just merely the, 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 the physical act of opening your homes, it's about something much more profound. It's about opening your hearts. Throughout Jesus' ministry, Jesus exemplified true hospitality. Jesus set the standard for hospitality. Take, for instance, there's an incident in the Bible where uh, he, was, he encountered Matthew, the tax collector, and he said, I I'm going to come to your house today for, for lunch. I said, okay. So Jesus went to Matthew's house. And Matthew was ripping people off. And after he spent some time with Jesus, he said, you know what, I'm going to change my life, I'm going to give back, I'm going to pay back plus extra to everyone that I've ripped off. Matthew opened his home to Jesus, and Jesus opened his heart to Matthew, and there was a transformation. And Jesus was doing something with Matthew. So hospitality at its core is more about providing more than just providing a place together. It's about creating a sense of belonging and acceptance and healing. It's about conveying to others that they are valued and cherished and that they are members of this community. And Jesus demonstrated this beautifully in his interactions with all kinds of outcasts, lepers, tax collectors, everyone who was marginalized. He welcomed them with open arms, showing them that they were not only accepted, but deeply loved. So in doing so, he revealed the true essence of hospitality, making everyone feel genuinely at home in his presence. Okay, so we got hospitality. The second thing I want to talk about is justice. And justice means standing up for what is right, tackling those inequalities head on and fighting for fairness in the world. It's about teaming up with God to ensure that the world operates according to its intended design. But here's the thing. When we talk about justice from a biblical perspective, it's way more than just what a lot of people think, doling out punishment for bad behavior. It's about recognizing and respecting inherent dignity in every person. It's about giving folks what they're owed as created beings in the image of God. And what people are owed. Maybe you know, whether that's punishment or when it's deserved or protection when they're vulnerable or simply care and support. And if you take a peek at the Bible, you'll notice that God's got a soft spot for the underdogs. He's about looking, looking out for the little guy, the, the ones who get overlooked, mistreated, or taken advantage of. That's what biblical justice is about. It's standing up for those who need it most and making sure that everyone gets a fair shake. It's about using your voice to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. It's about standing shoulder to shoulder with the oppressed, even when it's tough. You 
when the man was healed by Jesus. The Pharisees didn't like it. Jesus did something that was good and right, but it was on the wrong day of the week, so the, he was given a hard time, but Jesus knew it was right, and so he did the thing that needed to be done. And sometimes we have to think like that, too. We have to get past those cultural norms where, where it says, oh, you can't do that. It's like, think of it, like, of it as like taking up your cross, the weight of standing with those facing injustice, even when it means facing consequences yourself. It's about sticking it out to the end. No matter how tough it gets, even if it isn't, it isn't fashionable anymore, because that's what true justice looks like in action. Third thing is to make your work your calling. It's about finding a deeper meaning and purpose in what you do. Letting your actions reflect your values and your beliefs. Your job is not just a place where you punch in and punch out. It's where real spiritual growth happens. It's where the stuff that, that you learn gets put into action. You know, it's, it's where the rubber hits the road. It's where you're truly tested. And let's be real, work isn't always a walk in the park, and you're going to face some serious challenges to your spiritual beliefs. But here's the thing, approach your work like it's your own spiritual boot camp. It's where you'll be tested. It's where you'll grow. It's where you'll come out stronger on the other side. And finally, the last thing I want to share with you, last practice, is sharing the good news. This one's all about spreading positivity, sharing stories of hope and inspiration, and shining the light in darkness in Jesus' name. You know, spreading the good news isn't reserved for people just standing in this pulpit. It's for everyone, wherever you are, and to whoever you meet. And there's no need for formulas or ways to do it or big speeches. It's all about walking alongside others and building connections and letting God's love shine through everything that you do, just like Jesus showed us. You know, Jesus isn't waiting for us to have it all together before we can join him on this mission. No, it's, he's inviting us just as we are, with all of our flaws just as they are. So here's the thing. We have to be true to, our, to ourselves. You have to be the person you are meant to be, the one that mirrors the image of Christ. And you're not meant to be a carbon copy of your neighbor or anyone else. Did I just say carbon copy? Gosh, I'm 50, right? So you, you don't have to be an iPhone scan of the person next to you. You're created in the image of God, unique and special in your own way. It's all about embracing who you are, the person God you intended to be, and sharing that with the world around you. So go ahead and just be that particular person that God had in mind when he made you offering your gifts and your talents, along with all your flaws and struggles, to make the difference wherever you go. Being on a mission means creating space for presence, for really being there with people. We can't assume that God is only present in certain situations and with certain people. No, nope. God's love is available to everyone everywhere, regardless of their circumstance. So let's remember that God is right here, right now, offering boundless love to the world. And if God is present, then our job is clear, that we need to be present too, fully embracing the opportunities to connect and make difference, make a difference in the lives of those around us. Would you pray with me? Lord, we do have so much to give like those preschoolers saying, You've put it all in us. You've made us special. You made us wonderfully. You made us in your image and likeness. And you've called us to be part of your family. Lord, give us the ability to see beyond our own barriers and to be able to be of service, to give the gift that you have given us to the world, the gift of our presence, the gift of 
everything that is in us. And Lord God, it's only through that will we see the true blessings that you have to offer. Lord God, we submit all this to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The ushers are going to come forward with uh, offering plates to collect today's offering. Uh, I invite you to put it in your offering. Um, but most importantly, I'd really love you to put that connection card in there with whatever, whatever information that you would like to share with us so that we can connect with you. Almighty and generous God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the bright sunshine, the cool air, and the breath that is in our bodies. Lord God, we have so much to give. And so, so Lord, we ask you to empower us. Give us the wisdom and the courage to be able to do so. And Lord God, we thank you that we're able to return these gifts. That we're able to fund this church. We're able to do the ministries that bring about the opportunities to be in mission with those who desperately need you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 292.
I want to thank you all for being here today. It's such an honor to have all of the, the parents and the family of the preschoolers. I appreciate it so much. There's a coffee hour down, just all the way down the hall in Cyril's Hall afterward. Now as we go from this place, let's go loving one another. Let's go bearing each other's burdens. Because God loves us all infinitely, and we are all interconnected. Go in peace, and may the God of peace be with you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.